G'day fans and welcome back to another exciting episode of Nerdy Things from Another World. Yes, it's the show discussing sci-fi movies, TV shows and even Australian sci-fi fandom. I'm your host Dags and with me is my co-host who is just so cool. Do you know he once ate Batman figures made of jelly which were six years out of date? Yes, of course it is Jeff Rowe. Hey Dags and let's just say I'm not afraid to rip it off the packaging. Uh, very, very cool. Yes, it is actually a true story. He was actually at a collector's fair. He did forget to bring his lunch. And having those jelly Batman figures sitting on the table, he did decide to just chow down not one, but all six of them. Do uh, you remember that? And you're sitting there and you go, yep, yeah, it was a bit chewy, but uh, it kept you going and you didn't die from poisoning, which was very, very cool. These are the stories that uh, fandom is made of. Absolutely fantastic. How you going, old son? What's happening in the world? What's happening in the world? The usual. So where it's like you have a list of collectibles you want to buy, but you look at your budget to spend and you go, well, let's put that on the want list for another fortnight and then another fortnight and then another fortnight. Absolutely fantastic. As we were saying, we're discussing sci-fi movies, TV shows and Australian sci-fi fandom. Funnily enough, I think we're covering all of that tonight because you've got a special letter that has just come through hot off the presses, so to speak. So who have we got tonight discussing what, Mr. Jeffro? Yes, I'm very happy to say that our reach has gone international. So we have a letter from uh, one Michael Giuseppe Foxarelli. <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> oh, God. oh, my goodness gracious me. So what is Michael Giuseppe Fox? What was it? Fonzarelli? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's actually, to give him his full name, Michelangelo Giuseppe, <laughs> although he spells Giuseppe with a J. Go oh, figure that. <laughs> so, Unbelievable. What's his letter? So um, Michelangelo says, Dear nerds, with a long history in science fiction fandom, what clubs were you a part of? God, what a good question. Uh, it's, it's an interesting one because uh, uh, both of us have been uh, in the fandom scene uh, for quite a long time, since the uh, probably even since the 80s, and maybe even in your case, even before that. And uh, sci-fi fan clubs were definitely a bit of a big thing back at the time. You were probably a member of more of them than I was. So uh, off the top of your head, old son, uh, what uh, springs to mind? Well, I, I was absolutely a uh, big-time uh, fan um, of joining fan clubs and all that. So I first joined fan clubs in about 1978. So if you remember Starlog magazine, one of the things that they put out was a um, book that listed all the fan clubs that were available. So I flicked through that and, uh, hey, there's Space 1999 fan clubs in America and, and other clubs. So it's like uh, I sent off my letter, sent off my international reply coupons, if you're old enough to remember what the heck they were, and uh, joined uh, many of these clubs. So uh, I was a member of about three different um, Space 1999 clubs at the time, and also the Martin and Barbara fan club, which is uh, Martin Landau and Barbara Bain. So uh, I joined that, and that was uh, my first introduction to, uh, to fan clubs. Very, very groovy. Uh, it's funny because... Um in the 80s, it's kind of hard to imagine this now, but in the 80s, um, when we were both primarily active, uh, people used to create fan clubs almost the drop of a hat. So a TV show or a movie would come out, mainly a TV show, I guess, and somebody would just say, wait, let's just make a fan club for it. They just whip one together and put the word out there, and most people would join it just to support it from uh, out of the box. Now, they wouldn't have the longevity that uh, some clubs would eventually have, but at the time, I think it was almost like a rite of passage to say, well, how many are you a member of? Now, I reckon your list would have been quite long. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. And I was uh, a member of one of those sort of fleeting clubs. It was the Howling Mad Murdoch Appreciation Society. So for the um, actor and the, uh, the character, Dwight Schultz, uh, there was actually a club for him, and that was based in the uh, ACT. And I wanted... The fleeting uh, uh, clubs I do remember was uh, the V Club. So that was brilliant to be on. And also, of course, in the 90s, we had the X-Files Club. So there's a mm. few that sort of uh, had their moment and, um, and have since disappeared. So with the V Fan Club, it really was just a bunch of teenagers who just said, yep, we love V. This is the mini series from the 1980s. Put together a club. It actually lasted quite a few years uh, with just a handful of people who just loved V. Whereas the X-Files Club... 
uh, was a bit of a funny story because I actually knew uh, knew this person who worked on the committee for the X-Files Club, and they got together and go, X-Files is a big deal in the 1990s, and uh, they they launch it, and they went out and they actually had printed 1,000 membership cards, right? And they're thinking, this is going to last us for like 20 years. This is awesome. And not only that, the creator of the club really wanted to have X as a membership number, so they did all their membership numbers in Roman numerals, and, of course, X is 10, so she could be listed as X, right? That's my membership number. Well, unbeknownst to them, they ended up with a thousand members within a month or two, and uh, not only did they run out of membership cards almost overnight, but of course, if you're trying to do, I'm member number seven hundred and fifty-three in Roman numerals. <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> so uh, yeah, that club exploded. It was massive. It's like if you get to uh, say to somebody at the end of a movie, okay, what year was that movie made? Just look at the Roman numerals at the end. Yeah. It's like half the people can't figure it out. Oh, yeah, and apparently there was a couple of people they had to sit and try and analyse uh, to work out what the membership numbers were for their members. But, I mean, I never joined the X-Files fan club. I used to go to all these events for clubs, but I never really joined them. It was just the thing. It's like, you know, oh, I don't know, I just didn't do it. But the uh, couple that I were involved with, so for myself, so uh, Austrek, which is the Star Trek fan club, which is still going. Uh, in next week or two, I'll have been there officially for 39 years. So uh, next year is my 40th anniversary with those guys, and I'm still hanging out and uh, going to their social functions or whatever. Never been on the committee, uh, and I'm now a life member of that group, that club. So they made me a life member back in 2016, which I was actually very proud to become a part of. And uh, also the Star, Walking, uh, Star Wars fan club, which I co-founded uh, back in 1988, and I was on the committee for for 28 years, so I did really well with that. But they're the only two that I was really associated with. Everything else I sort of just attended. Like you mentioned, the V Fan Club. There was the Melbourne Science Fiction Club, which is still going after nearly 70-something years now. And, uh, in fact, I went to one of their events only about three weeks ago. So it's uh, an interesting sort of part of history that uh, not only the events uh, and the activities that these clubs had, but attending them as well was a way of showing support for uh, what they were doing. And the activities that they did back in the 80s and 90s, I mean, it's fairly unique. I mean, you'd never get that sort of thing now. So, like, for example, the Doctor Who Club, the big thing was its audio tape library. I mean, we don't need that now. But at the time, that was huge to be able to sort of borrow out a uh, uh, hmm. an audio of the story recorded off the television. And, of course, uh, back in the 80s, that was also my gateway to finding the uh, tape trading network. So, you know, well, if you got such and such, oh, yes, I have, and I'll swap you for such and such. So that was a huge thing in the 80s to sort of for fan clubs is to have this sort of little offshoot where your videotape collection could uh, expand quite nicely if you uh, had the right stuff or paid the right money. And, of course, the other thing too with um, fan clubs is the Christmas parties. They were legendary. Mm. So that would be a huge event. So... With the Doctor Who Club, they'd often have a premiere or something that had never been seen. And with the Star Trek Club, it was just an all-out excuse to do massive uh, costuming. So uh, they're, they're some of the aspects I remember. Actually, I'd forgotten about the Christmas parties, but, yeah, they were a really big deal. And uh, for a period of time there in the late 80s and the early 90s, the Star Trek Club in particular was like – it was – even people who didn't like Star Trek went to these geeks because they were just so big and they're so extravagant. And, I mean, they weren't necessarily sustainable. I mean, they weren't that way for the next 20 years. But at that time, they were must-attend events. And it's kind of funny because even as far as like uh, or as recent as like maybe 10 years ago, um, clubs were still doing Christmas parties. And I remember there was actually one for each weekend, three weekends in a row. And a mate and I actually went to them. So Austrek was first, the Star Trek club. Then there was the Star Wars uh, Christmas party the weekend after, and then the Doctor Who Club Christmas party the weekend after that. So it was three Christmas parties in a row, and we attended all three of them. So it was kind of weird just sort of comparing them all together and seeing what it was all like. But, uh, um, yeah, they were really, really good good events, and, uh, yeah, they were certainly things that uh, you had to be there at the time. Um, one of the things that you didn't mention uh, in terms of fan clubs was the old Red Squadron, the Battlestar Galactica Club, which your wife actually um was running for a long period of time. Now, that was a good example of a club with s such a small membership, but it stuck it out for nearly 20 years or thereabouts. The Red Squadron Club was a prime example if you actually have a club made up of uh, extremely uh, close and uh, good friends. 
So uh, a lot of clubs, it's like you'll know certain people, but, you know, there'll be people that you uh, don't recognise. But the Red Squadron Club was all friends uh, and they knew how to uh, enjoy themselves. So they'd be sort of movie nights and they'd be uh, camping trips and, and all that. So even though the show itself uh, was well and truly dead, it was just an excuse for a whole bunch of friends to get together. Yeah, it was a good example of something that did not have to be big to survive. And even throughout my entire time in the fan club history, I've I mean, like you would have seen this too, seen it all, seen friendships form, relationships, marriages, kids, the whole thing. And uh, regarding that, here's a story. I don't think I've even shared it with you. So uh, when I was uh, looking after the social club meetings for Star Walking, the Star Wars Club, so I was running them in Melbourne and in Sydney. And I was at a party one time, and this six-year-old girl and I, we, we sort of met in the doorway. And I looked down at her, and she looked up at me, and I said to her, you know, it's because of me that you exist. And, of course, she just said straight away, it was like, no, it's because of mum and dad. And I said, but your mum and dad met <laughs> at a social club meeting that I was running. So if that wasn't running, they wouldn't have met, you wouldn't be here. And you could see the cogs just turning in her head. And she turned 21, I don't know, about maybe six or seven years ago or whatever, and she still remembers that story. <laughs> That's story. So, um, yeah, so matchmaking uh, fans was definitely something that was really high on the list, and uh, it was really good. And and you are the Michael J. Fox of the enchantment under the sea. You know, if it hadn't been for you, you know, sort of the two couples wouldn't have got together again. That's actually very, very true. I hadn't really thought about that. But, I mean, time does horrible things to, to clubs, and things change. People come and go. And one of the things that I vividly can recall is that like Austrek, the Star Trek Club, started in 1976 and it had its 15th anniversary in 1991. And one of the club members made a documentary video, just a low-key one, interviewed all these fans discussing the whole history of the club to that point. And you, if I got a copy of that video. And if I watch it today, I'm the only one left out of everybody who appeared in it who's still going to Austrek meetings. And it's not like everybody left last week. They left a couple of decades ago. You know, I know you haven't been on an Austrek gig for a long time yourself. And um, it's kind of funny because all the people in those in that uh, environment, they've all been replaced. Then those people got replaced and those people got replaced. And yet I've remained consistent the whole way through. So it's kind of funny seeing how the, 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 how the change occurs throughout time. The demographics change, the people change. And, um, yeah, it's just a, it's like time moving right before your very eyes. So... Yeah. It, it is fairly um, difficult if you sort of like um, get married and have a family and all that. Those those days of sort of going out to um, club meetings and all that kind of sort of get uh, put on the back burner until sort of they get forgotten completely. So like, like many things, whether it be uh, interest in um, TV shows or interest in movies or interested in um, sports, you know, you might have your moment and then you sort of think, oh, okay, I'm going to move on to something else. And I mean, you are uniquely consistent and I got to give you credit for that. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, you're right. Right. It all comes down to priorities. And for a lot of people, they sort of come in at their, at their time, especially if they're younger. Cause when we got into the whole fan thing, we were all quite young. We were probably like me in your teens, early twenties. And it's really big. It's really important. But then, you know, other priorities kick in and then you decide to move on. I chose not to move on because I thought well, I had nowhere else to go. And I said, oh, I really enjoy it. Why would I Why would I leave? And hence the reason why I've sort of just stuck around, which is, uh, you know, it's it's really groovy. So another club that actually did well for itself uh, was the Melbourne Science Fiction Club. And what was unique about those guys is instead of meeting like every month or two uh, on a Saturday, they actually met every Friday night at the same venue. And you remember this really quite well. It was like every Friday, if you had nothing on, you went to their gigs. And some of them were really low-key, and there might be a handful of people there. Other times, they were actually really popular. A lot of people were there. But it was like the MSFC was the place to just hang out for year after year after year after year on a Friday night. Remember those? Oh, abs absolutely. And I think the uh, a bit like the Red Squadron sort of um, group is that you didn't necessarily have to be interested in, in books and uh and sort of uh, speculative fiction and such, you're just there to enjoy the company of uh, everyone else that was turning up. Exactly right. And as I said to someone not that long ago, I mean, Melbourne was one of the rare places probably in the world where every weekend there was something on. Now, whether it be the Saturday, right, whether it be a fan club or a convention, if nothing was happening, at least you had the MSFC on a Friday night. 
and uh, and I thought that was great. So some days you actually went to the MSFC on a Friday night. You go to a fan club meeting, whatever, on the Saturday. It might be a social gig on the Sunday, and it's like that's awesome. And that wasn't that wasn't an unusual thing. That was a common thing. So we were lucky to be a part of it at that time. And I mean, as I said earlier, age had something to do with it. And if you were too young, we couldn't have done it. If we were too old, it might not have been as interesting. But we're in the right place at the right time at the right age. And for whatever reason, there was just things happening on a regular basis. And I know uh, I ran social events, even at my own house, uh, when I was promoting a convention that I was running. And did you ever, you, you would have uh, been involved with some of the stuff yourself, yeah? Oh, absolutely. And I remember that we used to have a, uh, a calendar that allowed us to sort of see whether there was any conventions or any uh, meetings that were going to sort of conflict. So we deliberately tried to pick um, mm. days and such that didn't overrun some other event. So we're very deliberate about making sure that uh, we stayed away from someone else's turf when we're booking uh, Doctor Who um, meetings or Christmas uh, parties or even conventions. I remember uh, planning two years ahead and just saying, well, what other person has taken the long, you know, Queen's birthday weekend? And it's like, oh, that that uh, hasn't been taken. Let's take that. But if someone else had already got it, then, okay, let's think of another weekend. Yeah, that's a very good point. The last thing you wanted to do was deliberately conflict with another gig because it would impact both your attendances and the attendances of the other group, and you are right. Sometimes it was hard to find a spot. I remember there was a fan club. They said, uh, yeah, we'll meet on the third weekend on the Saturdays uh, of the month because the first and second weekend are already t- taken and the fourth is taken so we'll just slot our way in here so it was in your best interest to ensure that you didn't conflict with anything and as an attendee it was awesome because you go i've got all these things to go to you know and it was just it just fed the if you will the nerd uh feeling of the time and you're sure some were better than others you might come to some and you go oh, that's a bit of a disappointing thing but by the same token it was just like well, I've got nothing else on. And this is obviously before the days of the internet, long before that. And and as we've discussed, one of the cool things is, is you'd go to an event and you could always tell how success, successful it was going to be by the cars parked out the front. Oh, it was grouse. You come around the corner, you go, oh, this person's here. They're there, they're there. No one had a brand new car. No one could afford it. And these days, of course, nearly everybody's got a brand new car, including yourself, funnily enough. It's it's true. I mean, we used to sort of like take up uh, almost like half of Dorcas Street going to the uh, Austrek meetings with all the cars. So for myself, as someone who attended fan club meetings uh, in Austrek for a number of years and then started running fan club meetings for Star Walking uh, in 1994, uh, that was the first one in Melbourne, it was a really sort of seeing it from a completely different perspective, not sitting in the audience, but actually up the front like, providing the entertainment. And the funny thing about our Skyforce meetings and I forgot this, right? So this is Star Wars fan club meetings in the mid-90s. And what we were used to do is, and I actually wrote this, would provide a news sheet that we would hand out to people when they arrived. And so when you turned up, it was called the, uh, the Skyforce Journal. And one of the things that had covered off was what happened in the previous meeting, the previous gig. Well, I found some of those about five years ago, and I'd long since forgotten about them. And I was looking them up, and I was, like, freaking out, where I would actually write down and say, oh, yeah, the numbers were down in the last meeting. We had 145 people set up. By today's standards, that's bigger than some conventions. It's like, holy moly, <laughs> what's the deal with that? Jeez. <laughs> oh, it, it really does show, you know, that uh, that's what fandom could be capable of. And you speak to a younger person now and they'd never believe you, but uh, it's it's there in black and white. It, it, it happened. Dude, I couldn't believe it. So, uh, yeah, that, that was just like freaky. So, um, and yet just because you had a big attendance doesn't necessarily mean the event itself was spectacular. Sometimes smaller events were actually the way to go. So there was a lot to sort of cover off back in those days. So with that in mind, hopefully we've answered the question from who who, who wrote that particular question again there, Jeffro? Yeah, that was uh, Michelangelo, <laughs> Giuseppe, <a> Foxarelli. <laughs> Freaking idiot. There we go. What can I say? Absolutely fantastic. Well, funnily enough, um, with fan clubs, fan clubs can't exist unless there's actually something that they're supporting. And that leads us into our main topic of conversation, which is uh, what are we discussing tonight, Mr. Jeffro? Now, what we're going to be discussing is a topic as to were the 1980s movies and television uh, shows the golden age of sci fi? 
So we're going to sort of work out uh, if they're winning the uh, the crown or whether there's some other challenges in other decades. Yeah, so we're talking about an entire decade here, and uh, it's it's a fair bit to cover off. And for us, you and me, it's you know obviously quite famous because right through from 1980 right through to 1989, there was just stuff getting pumped out everywhere. And I think a lot of it really had to do with the fact that the movie studios finally realised that sci-fi actually was a viable genre that uh, not only was successful in the eyes of the public, but could also, especially on the film side, bring in a lot of money. And since then, of course, once you rolled into the 90s and the 2000s, uh, that momentum has continued on. So uh, what are your thoughts, old son, about whether it was the golden age or not? I mean, for me, the, the start, of course, was uh, Star Wars. Anything before that was very slim pickings. We only had just had uh, Starburst and Starlog magazine come out. Before then, there was a couple of uh, text books about science fiction movies, but it was really uh, nothing there. And, of course, um, Star Wars rolls around and changes it. I, I almost felt like I, was sort of, I could call myself a closeted science fiction fan. So after Star Wars, I could come out of the closet and, you know, embrace my geekness and, and, and show my uh, loyalty by uh, wearing things like uh, badges and um, uh, if you could get them, T-shirts. So uh, 77 and then after was where the real breakthrough came. And, of course, after, uh, after that, we did see movies get better and better. And I think the true representation of the best movies is actually in the 80s yeah it's funny because like in the 70s um which a lot of younger people wouldn't be aware of and they go why did star wars like be such a different film to everything else prior to it and of course and i've discovered discussed this in other shows as well is that in the 1970s in particular you were dealing with the cold war in real life and you had the vietnam war so the world itself was pretty depressed at the time and the films represented that. Everything that was set in the future was just like really down in the dumps. So if you had your uh, your Silent Runnings and Ultimate Warriors and uh, Soylent Greens and other films of that type, they were all like miserable. You go and watch them and you go, mate, the future is completely stuffed. And ironically, Soylent Green in particular was set in 2022, which is only last year. Um, so, and then, yeah, Star Wars comes along and completely changes it. And all of a sudden people realise, oh, there's actually a level of entertainment here, which is kind of cool. But you go through... Back prior to that, even through the 1960s, I guess there was a bit of a massive change in the way films were being produced. But then you roll back into the 50s and the entertainment factor there for sci-fi films was always there. But I think the intellectual side wasn't. And I guess with a couple of exceptions, obviously, but wasn't like UFOs landing on Earth and taking over the Earth and big monsters terrorising cities. There was only a handful of movies that really allowed you to think and go, this is really good stuff. I can really get something out of this. But by the time you got to the 80s, there was a something for everybody, whether it be action-related, uh, scientific-related, or just basic switch your brain off at the door-related, so to speak. Um, yeah, there was a lot going for it, and that started almost from, like, 1980 onwards. When I was looking through the, uh, the different decades, one of the things I noticed about the 1950s is, yes, there is some really brilliant movies, and I can understand how if you pick those ones out, you could say this is the golden era. But for every War of the Worlds, there was also a robot monster that came out or the Twonky or low budget movies like Project Moonbase and Catwoman on the Moon. So as it, it was like there were some brilliant ones out there, but uh, that was only like it's like an iceberg. There's 10 percent good movies, but the other 90 were real turgids. Yeah, and, and that's that's a fair call, too, uh, because. I mean, I can't imagine anybody, as you said, saying, well, I'm a science fiction fan. I take it really, really seriously. And they're watching something like, you know, um, Invasion of the Saucer Men or something like that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a fair point. And I think it's only because once the 80s kicked in, uh, as I said earlier, the studios and the TV uh, companies realised, well, actually, there's something here that can uh, really it can really go places. But it did start in the 70s. And funny enough, some of the biggest films of the 80s were sequels of movies made in the 70s, whether they be Star Wars, Alien, Star Trek. So... The late 70s really has a lot going for it, and it could have actually been the the golden age of sci-fi in the 70s if it wasn't for everything prior to 77. And with the 80s, I mean, there's no better example than the year 1982. So if you do an internet search, uh, people will say, 
1982 is the year because that's when we saw in that uh, 12 month period et the thing blade runner star trek ratha khan tron conan the barbarian mad max 2 the dark crystal q the wing serpent swamp thing there's just and that's just in one year so i mean you will never see any other decade sort of represented that well with that many movies and the good thing is there's something for everybody in that so if you like your cute and cuddlies you go to et if you like your horror movies you go to the thing if you like something that makes you think a bit you got your blade runner and of course if you're a fan of star trek you had ratha khan and of course you know shows like tron were really sort of like um completely cutting edge in terms of the way they looked. And, of course, if you just like your dystopian futures and just dudes just killing each other, you got your road warriors. So there was certainly something for everyone there. And I think that set a standard for things to come. And, of course, from the TV side, I think some of the strongest TV shows certainly originated in the 70s, but there was certainly enough to get you through into the 80s, like your Doctor Who was still carrying through the 1980s. And, of course, Star Trek The Next Generation started there. I think your Alien Nations kicked off in the 80s as well. And there was something on the small screen for people to dial into uh, if you're really into it. And, of course, even with Star Wars, there was TV shows, even though there were cartoons, your droids and Ewoks. So it's not like the small screen got missed either. And I think the television shows that came out in the different de- decades uh, sort of did represent sort of what kind of movies uh, we were getting as well. So in the 70s, a lot of it was very um, uh, grimmed, for want of a better word. I mean... Certainly, um, Space 1999 was, and things like the the Star Lost, uh, Arc Two. So they, and then we saw the um, uh, the eighties, and then again that was a reflection of what we were seeing in the um, uh, in the movies. So we got to see more adventure. We got to see better special effects. Uh, we got to see the stories improve. Uh, so again very reflective of the um, uh, the movies that were coming out. But I think the problem with uh, the 1990s is that the 80s was so strong, so powerful. I guess the biggest thing for, say, TV in the 90s, there was a lot. There was a few, but Star Trek was definitely uh, hitting its peak at that point. So both Next Generation, DS9 and Voyager, they were all throughout the entire decade of the 90s. And the funny thing is when you roll into the 21st century, into the 2000s, and I've discussed this with a lot of people, and say... If you take out your big franchises, even in the past 20 years, right, so you take out your Marvel movies, your Star Wars movies, your Star Trek movies, what's left? And people really struggle. And and the movies that were being produced in the past 20 years, there's some really good stuff there, really, really good. But a lot of it sort of you struggle to sort of remember what it is. You have to sit and analyse and go, oh, what was there? And you go, oh, there was this one and there was that one and there was this one. As to whether they're going to be considered memorable in the future, I don't know. But typically when you ask someone today, name some great sci-fi movies, most of the ones that they're going to mention will have at least a presence in the 1980s. I find that the uh, the, the 80s and the 90s and, and, and such, there was a, a lot of great independent studios that were able to sort of uh, uh, come up with some very creative ideas. Whereas I think uh, now in the sort of the recent last 10 to 15 years, uh, studio like disney has sort of uh crushed a lot of that independent um production and that's where why we don't see as many original movies or creative movies as what we used to because we don't have the roger corman new world pictures or uh the canon films uh, and those sort of low budget companies that used to uh, produce a lot of the stuff that we uh, loved and in fact one of the reasons why i think um that the 1980s was so successful and you are right about the independent studios is because of the video revolution so it's easy to forget it now but when the video revolution kicked in the 1980s and i remember this vividly when the video stores suddenly opened up everywhere every second shop was a video store there were people who were making movies specifically for the video market and there was a place for them to go so it made sense for studio studios to say We'll produce these new sci-fi movies that we stick them in the cinema. Once they're done, we stick them in video and they get even more market share. They, they, They sell even more from video hiring. And there's a lot to be said about that because that's the reason why I think there's so much content being produced in that decade because even if it didn't work in the cinema, it would work on video. 
And a lot of people, and I was one of them, who would go into the video store and sci-fi had a section unto itself. It was usually next door to horror. And you'd just have a look at these titles and some of them you would have seen in the cinema. Some of them you wouldn't have seen at all. And you'd be going, well, you know what? I'm just going to hire them all out and watch them. And I think that had a lot to do with as to why so much content was being produced at that time, which is not as prevalent as it is today. I mean, you're so true about that. Uh, many of the uh, Roger Corman movies were made as they used to call uh, director video. And the good thing is that um, you could actually sort of um, make your, your budget back quite easily because you're selling these videotapes to uh, the video stores for 80 or $90 a pop. And if you're then really greedy, you could then go straight to the, um, uh, the direct to uh, retail market and sell them at uh, retail chains. But these days, uh, unless you want to, Put something online and, and and sell it as a streaming thing for five dollars. You don't quite have that uh, financial avenue that uh, they used to have in the eighties to to be able to make those kind of movies. Well, the downside to these days, and I've seen this firsthand, is that um, if you produce a film, a sci-fi movie, and it's a good one, and you go, you know what, it doesn't, it's not going to get cinematic release. I'll put it on DVD slash Blu-ray. There's no libraries anymore. So it's not like you just walk into a library and you go, oh, I've never heard of that. I'll go and check that out. They don't exist. So sure, you can buy them online, but unless you know it exists in the first place, you'll never find it. So that's the downside. And I think that's one of the reasons why the 1980s in particular, people remember so much of what they saw because of what they saw in the video store. And you can say, look, I never saw it in the cinema. It never got released in the cinema, but it did get released on video. And that's the reason why it was so successful. Now, that, of course, carries through through the 1990s and some of the 2000s because uh, video stores were still prevalent in that um, that decade. And there could be, if you stick them end-to-end, -end, there will be a lot of, say, younger people who say the 1990s was the decade of, of, of greatness. And it probably was to a large degree, as we discussed earlier. But whether as to it was as good as the decade prior, it's hard to say. And with the uh, the 90s, I was having a look at the different movies and all that, and I think this is where sort of um, the 80s was the peak, and with the 90s, they were just trying a little bit too hard because uh, we we saw more movies that were sort of aimed towards the pop corn culture. So we had movies like Total Recall, Mars Attacks, Galaxy Quest, Men in Black, where uh, they were doing a lot of uh, huge effects and throwing in a lot of big stars and, and cracking a lot of jokes. So it was all a little bit true tryhard. And uh, we, we didn't really get uh, too many uh, original movies, but we did get to see, as you said, a lot of uh, sequels. So in the, uh, the 90s, we got to see Terminator 2, Back to the Future 3, Star Trek First Contact, Robocop 2, The X-Files movie, and, of course, Star Wars Episode 1. So uh, uh, there, was, uh, uh, there was good movies, but uh, nothing really truly original, and I think that's where the, the 80s was uh, uh, the, the winner. That's not saying that what things that have been produced since then, it's like the 90s is streets ahead of everybody. There's been a lot of really good content produced in the past, say, three decades, uh, which is really, really good to see. And there's still good stuff being produced today. But in terms of just like the variety, the quantity and just the uniqueness of it. And I guess that has something to do with the, the, the content that was being produced. You could say we've never seen anything like this before. Whereas today, if a film is made, it's easy to just go, you know what, it's great, but I've seen this sort of thing already. I've seen it all before. Say so like the remake of Total Recall, which I thought was fantastic, has shades of Blade Runner in it. You got all these movies. You can go, you know what? I can see the genesis of where this came from. And uh, whereas you get to the nineteen eighties, and you go, you know what? I've never seen anything like the thing, like the remake of the thing. I've never seen anything like uh, Tron. Um, and I think that's why people would watch some of these movies, and you go, you know what? This is this is groundbreaking stuff. And there was a lot of it, which was uh, really good. And I think that has a lot to do with what we're seeing now. I mean, Alien came out in, uh, it's like in the 70s, but Aliens came out in the 80s, 86. And you look at Aliens and you go, you know what? I've never seen anything like that before. You know, there was nothing like that prior. That was all cutting edge. And I think there's a lot to be said about that. And I was just thinking back to a discussion that we'd had uh, a couple of weeks ago where we were talking about, can you name a a movie or even a, a 
television series, science fiction related, that uh, is memorable or groundbreaking in the last 10 or even 20 years. And it's really hard to sort of think of something that, uh, uh, like, we can easily go and, and name those ones in the 80s and 90s and all that, and we've watched this stuff for the last 20 years on in the cinemas and, uh, and, and on television, but can we remember the recent stuff? And mm. it's just something about that uh, means that if you can't really remember it, does it sort of mean that um, we can sort of really say, okay, maybe the, the, the 2000s or the 2010s can be the golden era? Yeah, and I think a lot of that has to do with the way people watch things now. As mentioned earlier about the whole, um, you can't, there's no libraries anymore to find anything. Streaming, as we've discussed in a different episode, has its own problems. Great material that gets released on a streaming service that some people won't watch because it's on a, they're not subscribed to that service. So um, going forward, um, I think there's going to be good examples of great products that just get missed by their target audience. I mean, it was, I was saying earlier about how you saw stuff that was really cutting edge, even things like Last Starfighter came out with the first movie with digital special effects with spaceships. I mean, it's been superseded like a thousand times since then, but someone had to be first and that was first and that was an 80s movie. So, uh, yeah, we're in the right sort of decade to see a massive transition between uh, what had come before it in the 70s and the 60s and the 50s to what was going to come after it in the 90s and the 2000s and... Uh, that was a transitional time, and for that reason, uh, I personally do think that uh, the 80s was the golden age of sci-fi movies and TV. TV is probably maybe debatable, but um, either way, it's still the golden age of sci-fi. If you're into sci-fi media, as you said, fans came out of the woodwork and uh, all the fan clubs were there to attest to it, which was good. And, I mean, just to uh, reinforce that, I mean, you look at merchandising that's been released in the last few years, and we have had things like, last starfighter merchandise uh we've had et merchandise uh there's always been mad max road warrior merchandise come out uh dark crystal uh merchandise mm. uh has has made a comeback so uh back to the future never really left us uh mm. that's always been merchandised uh so i i don't see that quite happening with any of the things from the other areas but uh, it's a telling point that the the eighties are still uh, being uh, merchandised because people want it and people acknowledge how good it was. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't even thought of that. And of course, the irony is there are sequels being made to movies that were started in the eighties. So you had Tron Legacy, Blade Runner twenty forty nine, and the prequel to The Thing, and they are all made in the past ten years. And the those original movies uh, originated in the eighties, even though the thing was a remake of the uh, the fifty two movie or whatever it was. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a very very telling point. So, uh, yeah, the eighties aren't going away anytime soon, which is absolutely fantastic. And I tell you what is going away right now is us. So uh, <laughs> I knew that was coming. Go. I knew that was coming. <laughs> There's a nice little segue into our exit. Any final words before we shove off for this evening, Mister Jeffro? Yeah, if people have any opinions or thoughts or agreements or disagreements, throw them in the comments. It would be interesting to uh, have a look at them. Absolutely fantastic, which is very, very groovy. Anyway, we're going to buzz off uh, for this evening. Uh, be sure to party hard, rock on, and as always, make sure you stay nerdy. Stay 80s. <laughs>